My name is Laurie Woods. I was born in Deloraine, Tasmania on the 26th of the 12th, 1922. At the age of 13, or just on 14, I left school and uh, I wanted to get a job to help my parents. So in April 1937, I got a job on the railway. Very good job. Six months probation, no pay, and if I was satisfactory at the end of six months, I would be discarded or I would be employed. I got transferred on pay to New Norfolk. It was quite a nice place to live. I joined the football club and played football, Australian rules, and uh, I had a girlfriend. That was mm, not my choice, but that was her choice. I wrote to my parents and said I would like to join the Air Force. Why would I want to join the Air Force? And I said, well, I left school when I was 13. I would like to improve my education. And if I join the Air Force, they'll teach me. And uh, that'll be that. So after a, uh, a week or so, ringing them up and talking to them and all the rest of it, they signed the papers. Okay, so then I was sent to the doctor to be checked. And as a, a cyclist, I'd been very successful, but I had, uh, I was going down Argyle Street in Hobart and this kid chased a ball out into the middle of the street and I couldn't miss him, but just as I hit him, I spun the wheel and of course I went over, hit the ground and I rinsed all the sinews away from the bone in my shoulder. There was no uh, free medicine or anything like that, so I just put up with it. And I could only get my arm up like this. And I remembered what my uncle had said when he joined the signalers in the First World War, his eye was bad. So the doctor said, okay, you've got to test your eyes, so put your left hand up over your eye, thus. He said, now read that. He said, now the other eye. And read that. And he got away with it. So when the doctor said, put your arm up, I put my arm up like this. And he said, now put the other arm up. And I put the other arm up to match it. I couldn't get it up. He said, okay. He said, but the trouble, you've got flat feet. I said, but what difference does that make? He said, oh, can't pass you. And I said, but I'm joining air crew, I'm not joining the army, so I don't have to march. Oh, okay, okay, well, you're okay. So I was put onto the reserve and uh, from uh, mid-November through to the 19th of June, I think it was, 19. 42, and I was called up. Five o'clock every morning, the sergeant in charge of our crew, or our group, would come through and make sure everyone was awake and out of bed, quick smart. And then we did, uh, on the square, uh, physical jerks and running around the square and there was an AC2 Pepper who was quite useless and he dropped his rifle one morning and one of the fellas laughed about it and uh, the WO discipline officer, Monty Parks, a red-headed bastard, he said, OK, double up round the square. And uh, so this fellow had all his knapsack and everything and the rifle, he had to double up round the square. And the fellow next to him laughed about it. 
He said, you too. And I couldn't resist. And he said, you too. So that was that. The next lot that came in, being good fellas, we were standing at the mess and the truck came in and uh, we started men making Monty Parks. You will be sorry, you will be sorry. And who should walk around the corner but Monty Parks, he said, they're not the ones that will be sorry, you're the fellas who will be sorry. So, cleaning out the trains for two weeks. I, yes, I became an, a leading aircraftsman then in LAC. After three months at Summers, we were sent to Mount Gambia, which was a, uh, a navigation school. It was quite a nice area. We moved to uh, Sale, West Sale, for bombing and gunnery. And there we were flying in ferry battles, the old single engine fighters that we used in the uh, retreat from Dunkirk. And from there, we were given our wing on a O with half a wing. And uh, we had a very complimentary name from then on. We were the fly flying arseholes. However, we had the wing. Anyway, we came further north and we arrived in Brisbane and uh, were unloaded into the really like cattle trucks, and taken down to the wharf and loaded onto the Willard A. Holbrook, one of the American Liberty ships. And uh, we had nothing to do but stand around the rail and the Brisbane River, honestly, never seen anything like it. We stood there amazed. You could almost see the bottom of the water and all these jellyfish. It was just a team of jellyfish. Never seen anything like it at that stage or since. But it was, the water was absolutely clear and it was wonderful. We were overnight on board ship. I volunteered to work in the in the cookhouse because that was closest to the, to the food, and uh, a lot of the others were uh, posted onto the guns and whatnot. But we all had to uh, do something, and we sailed out of Brisbane, and it was all oh, you know quite exciting. Uh, it would be an interesting trip. Uh, we knew we were probably headed to England, but how do we get there? And uh, we're sailing along on the first or second night, and there's a ship coming towards us, and it's it's got searchlights on the front and on the back of the ship, shining down onto the water. That's funny. When, we, when it came closer, it's only a couple of hundred yards away to the starboard, it's got a big red cross on the side and it's a hospital ship. Four hours later, it came over the radio that the Australian hospital ship had been sunk out from Brisbane We had to keep a very strict watch out to make sure that uh, that submarine didn't get us. Anyway, we sailed out on about our 16th day at sea. A couple of dirigibles came out, apparently from America, and we're coming into this harbour and there's a great big bridge. Ha! Ah, the Golden Gate Bridge. We must be at San Francisco. So we came into San Francisco, they dropped 
uh, anchor right in the middle of the harbour and uh, we then were ferried from there over past Alc the island of Alcatraz, the prison island that uh, became so famous, and over to Oakland and there they loaded us onto trains, beautiful trains compared with what uh, we had in Australia, uh, probably equal to the spirit of progress, I suppose, and uh, away we went. And on the second or third day out, we were on the outskirts of Chicago and uh, we're all, all of us amazed to see a negress driving a Packard, which was a super duper car as far as we were concerned at that stage, and she was smoking a cigar. We'd never, never seen anything like it. Anyway, we settled into Camp Mile Standish and we had Flight Lieutenant Goddard was our, in charge of our group. And he said it's a closed camp. So, we reckon, what do we do in a closed camp? So, they had dancers. We go along and there's a lot of American women, and uh, I don't know, there could have been people from outside. And they'd walk up to you and, would you like to come shagging with me tonight? What are they talking about? Anyway, we learned that shagging was dancing. We uh, got on the train for New York and we were put on board the Queen Elizabeth, 23,000 on board, and we were uh, stacked in bunks about three high and had a few canteens on board, but they ran out of food very quickly because with the 23,000 on board, there was not enough for to keep them going. Anyway, we're three days out from New York and uh, uh, suddenly the ship took a violent manoeuvre and practically everyone was almost tipped out of bed and we found out the next morning that we'd run into what they thought what well, might have been a pack of submarines or a pack of whales. But he had altered course 90, 90 degrees to port and clapped on everything to get away from it. And we were doing 43 knots. That was fast for the big ships. And they, the ship was shuddering like that for about 12 hours before they cut down to normal speed. And then we went round the north of Ireland and up the Clyde. Beautiful. On the port side, all these white cottages all the way along the... And uh, it was very nice. And we we're about halfway up the Clyde and a Spitfire came along and we're looking, we're on the ship and we're looking down here at a Spitfire flying along. And uh, we went up ahead, turned around and came down back on the other side. And we all agreed, must be a stupid bloody Australian pilot. It was just breaking day when we passed through London and it was a sight to see all the damage that had been done with all the bombing. You know, whole rows of houses, either half houses or none left. And uh, we thought, okay, it'll be our turn next. We're headed, apparently, to bomb Germany, so we'll get our own back. Anyway, we carried on and we were at 
arrived in, Gra in Brighton, seaside resort, and uh, it wasn't a very safe place because on the previous three nights there'd been an air raid. So uh, we were quartered in these hotels right on the foreshore. I know we were bedded down in the Grand and uh, we got, there was a, an air raid siren went that night and we were at the windows watching and you could see the planes flying along not far out from the shore and the tracer bullets, you know, flying across and suddenly there's an explosion, there's a German gone. Good. Then we returned to Victoria Station to come back to Brighton and an air raid developed. So we were standing outside the station looking at it all, you know, taking it all in. And one of the uh, cops came along and he said, hey you fellas, you better get down underneath. What for? He said, you might get killed. Yeah, but if we go down there, we might get buried too. <laughs> so we stayed and watched it. And then we set off back to West Frew and when we got there, there's a the latest super fortress standing just at the end of the runway. And there was just room for us to land and that was all. So, of course, being inquisitive, we walked over to the, uh, this fortress and opened the door, walked in, had a look at their bomb site and all the rest of it interior. Nothing startling there, not, not you know, the Yanks had been saying what a wonderful thing it was. Okay, it was about equivalent to what we were using. Over into the mess. What's the fortress doing out there? Oh, that's an American crew. They flew it in from the States. Yeah, but what's it doing here? Well, it was supposed to go to Presswick. That's 75 miles further up the coast. And they were lost. This was the first drone they came to. So they, they landed here. That was about the state of the American Air Force at that stage. And uh, it was right on the point of uh, D-Day. So we uh, did two diversionary raids where they sent a whole group of planes out here and the invasion was taking place here. So this would attract the fighters and everything away from there. But the first raid was okay, we got away with that. The second raid, we must have flown over, either, we reckon it was a Royal Navy. And if a plane flew over a Royal Navy ship, they would blast away at it, no matter what. So we came back with a sizeable hole from that one. Then we were posted to 460 Squadron. 460 Squadron was the senior Australian Lancaster Squadron in Flying and Bomber Command. It was commanded by Group Captain Huey Edwards, the first man to win the VC Victoria Cross, the Distinguished Service Order, Distinguished Flying Medal. And he was a good fella. He had a hoppy leg from a, where he'd been uh, crashed before, but he was a man you could talk to. And later when I was interviewed for him, he asked me if I'd like to be an officer. And I said, not particularly. And he said, why not? Wouldn't you like to be in the officer's mess? And I said, no, I wouldn't. And he said, why not? And I said, because there are a lot of bloody drunks there and I don't drink. <laughs> we uh, converted onto the Lancasters and uh, we did quite a lot of training. And uh, we'd fly out over the wash and they'd drop 
al aluminium sea markers and then we'd fly over and we could blast those with our guns. I got barred because I blew them to pieces and there was nothing left for the gun for the gunners. So I wasn't allowed to fire anymore. We started uh, operations just after D-Day and uh, they ranged from 300 Lancasters in a flight or up to a thousand bomber raids. I did three times a thousand bomber raid in the one day, but uh, in uh, a raid on Douai in France, we were uh, in daylight. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, my bombs were the, f the fifth stick of bombs to hit the ground. And my first bomb hit an ammunition train and I've never seen such, such a terrific explosion. This, it went straight up right through the, the yard, a fantastic explosion. And probably the, about the next raid I think it might have been was Gilson Kirshen in the middle of the Ruhr Valley. Incidentally, we did 19 trips into the Ruhr Valley and that was known as the Valley of Death. But on this occasion, we're coming up on the target and it's just like a hailstorm of uh, icicles. How, how can you fly through them and miss them? But these were shells and, you know, splinters and uh, I was shaking like a leaf. I didn't know what I could do. I couldn't talk. I couldn't do anything. And uh, we're getting closer and closer and it was only a matter of half a minute or so and suddenly there's a terrific explosion and then I'm just like this. And I dropped our bombs and no problem, steered the skipper through the target and uh, we got back safely, but half, half our roof was gone. A Lancaster had been blown up probably about 50 feet above us and of course took the top of our roof. So, uh, and the Lancaster of course was still flyable and I talked with uh, Irin, and he said that when the plane blew up just in front of them, Hugh Edwards just flew straight through. He didn't try to dodge or anything like that. And uh, he had probably had that much experience that he probably thought, well, if I go straight through, I might get through, I might not. But if I dodge, is that going to improve my chances? No. The quicker I get through, the better. So, that's what it was all about. Well, the paratroopers were dropped in the Arnhem Gap and we were on a Saturday afternoon raiding a place called Emmerich and uh, it was daylight and uh, one of our ground crew, Artie Shaw, wanted to go with us on one of these trips so the skipper said, well this is a reasonably quiet trip, you can come with us. So he got the okay and Artie came with us. But the trouble was running up onto the uh, onto the uh, bombing run. There were five Lancasters shot down just round us, and Hardy, you know, was starting to get a little bit worried. Anyway, dropped the bombs, but in doing so, I had as she dropped the bombs, the photograph was taken automatically to prove that you had done that. And in my photo was 
a photograph of a Lancaster that was just below us and had been hit in this port in a motor and was on fire and he was going down and hit on the bank of the uh, Rhine River. No, no survivors. That became quite a, a famous photograph in Europe. A lot of people used it, you know, in publications, etc. I did see photographs later of uh, Emmerich and the only thing left standing was a 200 foot smokestack from one of the uh, factories there. The bridge too far was unsuccessful, unfortunately, but we had knocked out the German communication line by bombing Emmerich and uh, some of our planes had bombed another city further on and one just before Emmerich. Our final mission, we were highly recommended at that stage that the bomb, the pilot and myself would be decorated when we were finished, but that was squadron talk. They used to, uh, it, all, it was almost like horse racing. They would pick on someone, say he's the favourite or so. And uh, anyway, we were, the A flight commander was leading, C flight commander was on the left flank and we were given the right flank and we were leading in bomber command through the target of one or I call a synthetic oil introduction factory. And uh, there were around about 350 planes in it and it was really uh, wonderful to look back and see these, all these Lancasters spread out behind us coming up on the target. And uh, <coughs> nothing was happening and uh, I gave the order to open the bomb bay and uh, let the bombs go and just the bomb doors had just closed and there was a terrific explosion and I heard lorry, lorry quick and uh, my my station was laying on the floor in the nose of the plane. I dashed back quickly and the pilot was slumped over and had fallen forward over the controls and we were going into a dive. And I grabbed the stick and pulled it back and uh, I signalled to the navigator and the engineer to lift the pilot out. And they lifted him out of his seat and laid him on the floor beside the pilot seat and uh, he, the pilot had given me a give it a go type of thing for 10 minutes one day and he had first of all tried the engineer and the engineer was turning us in on a bank and couldn't handle it so then he gave me the 10 minutes and he said okay after, if anything happens to me, you are to take over. And this is probably two to three months later, this happened and he called me and of course I took over. <coughs> and the first thing I, when I looked at him, he was bleeding through the, he had a, a piece of ACAC straight in under the eye here and as they said, another fraction of an inch he'd have been killed instantly, so we were lucky. But he appeared to be bleeding through the, out through it, through his nose and through his mouth. And I thought, well, he's not going to last too long, so the quicker I get back to England, the better if I can. So I 
had 3,000 roofs and plus 12 boost set up by the engineer on, and he fiddled about, so I wiped his hand out and just shoved the throttles forward to approximately where it should be, and then I said, synchronise the motors. But I had to get over the rest of them, so I went up over and put it into a dive, and one of the squadron planes followed me, or tried to follow me, and he said uh, we were, he reported we were shot down over the target, last seen going into cloud. Anyway, in the cloud, the icing was very bad, and if you get too much icing, the plane becomes unflyable and you'll just crash. So I had to get out of it instead of flying straight and level out of it, I came out and the plane was coming like this. So I straightened up and I thought, hmm. I waited for about half an hour and there's another break in the cloud and this time I headed down into the cloud before we got to the break, icing up badly. The mid-upper gunner was yelling out a bit into the, into the open and I wasn't going to turn or try and dodge anything I, so I had to go into the cloud again to get underneath it. And I was thinking, I wonder if I will ever see my mother and father again. I've got a job to do and I uh, there was enough room for me to put my hand up onto the roof to hold me in my seat. I wouldn't strap myself in because I thought if I need to get out in a hurry. That was a stupid thought because uh, many times afterwards I thought about it. There's no way that I would have, if I didn't, if I wasn't flying the plane, I wouldn't have been able to get out anyway. But that on the spur of the moment I had my hand up there to hold me in the seat because it was that rough. Anyway, we come out of the cloud at about 1500 feet and our navigator for that trip was the navigation leader and uh, I had said to him, give Ted a shot of morphine and uh, he said, I can't do that. And I said, you bloody well do it because I can't fly this plane and do that too. I was a warrant officer. He was a flight lieutenant, an officer. But he had to do what I said and he didn't, didn't like doing that, but he did. Anyway, uh, Later when Group Captain Huey Edwards was talking to him, he said, and what did you do, Coffee? And he said, he stuttered and stuttered, and then he said, well, sir, I took charge of the plane. Like hell he did, he did nothing. I think he was frightened. I think he was shell-shocked into silence. But uh, I instructed the the uh, wireless operator to give Manston, the crash landing drone, a call to say, uh, skipper or pilot badly wounded, bomb aimer flying, request straight in landing. Instead of, normally you had to circle a drone and then land, but in this case, straight in. And so it came back okay. And then I got the engineer to, uh, the navigator, to take a fix and give me a course. And he said, five degrees starboard. That was, uh, we'd have been about two mile off the end of the runway when we got there. That was from my reckoning. And, uh, 
I had set course initially by the sun because the, de the one, one compass was damaged and the other was toppled by my flying and uh, I had been a Boy Scout and I was able to get my uh, fix a bearing by my watch and I followed that until the compasses were back in circuit again. Anyway, I set the plane up for landing with the flaps and as the wheels went down, of course, the plane shakes and the skipper roused himself and indicated he wanted to get back in. So I said, OK, we're about 100 feet off the ground, lifted him back into the, his seat and I stood behind him, rode shotgun and uh, he made a perfect landing and then he collapsed over the controls about halfway down the runway so I had to cut the motors and uh, stop the plane and that was it. And I was very, very comfortable, thank you very much. And immediately I was sent down to uh, London. I was had an immediate award of the Distinguished Flying Cross. I got a field commission, as they say in the army. And so I was sent immediately to London to be fitted out for an officer's uniform. I stayed there for about a week while I was waiting and the war was still on with Japan so I decided repatriation. I got back to Australia and was given uh, six weeks disembarkation leave and during that time the Japanese packed in so uh, I had been requested by the Tasmanian Transport Commission they wanted me out to take over the con con uh, control of the Hobart Bridge toll collections. And so I was discharged and went back to work for my 22nd birthday. This is the AM for having written up the history of 460 Squadron and the Australians in Bomber Command generally. That is the AM. This is the Distinguished Flying Cross and that is an immediate award. They are quite unusual. There were a lot of Distinguished Flying Cross but not an immediate award. And this one here, it's the Legion of Honour, the top medal for France. It is uh, only 37 Australians hold it. When we returned from overseas, we were ignored. We were, nobody wanted to hear anything and they didn't understand anyway, so it was not much good of talking to them. And the only uh, relief we had was on Anzac Day when you met up with your mates. It was 70 years before they put a memorial in London, in London, mind you. But at least here in Australia, we've got G for George in the War Memorial in Canberra, and we've got Dr. Brendan Nelson, who is a wonderful man, looking after it. And uh, he's done his best for us. Coming back into civilian life was very difficult, excepting for the fact that I had this job I was only one of six on the Commissioner's staff for the Transport Department in Tasmania and it was a very responsible job and kept me fairly busy. 
but my home life was uh, no good. I had married this uh, first wife and uh, she remained probably as a young lady, had a daughter and uh, I had been through the war and when I came back we just didn't, uh, we didn't work together. I had to leave, I couldn't take any more of it. For some reason, I, I copped uh, post-traumatic stress and I was taken to uh, Concord in Sydney and I was given shock treatment, one lot, and then the specialist suggested that I, it wasn't very successful so I should have another one and I picked up a sizeable table and I said, you bastard, you talk to me like that, I'll smash this over your head. He said, it's all right, Mr Woods, you can go home tomorrow. So I went home tomorrow and first night in bed with my wife, I had a nightmare. I, she was as big as you. I picked her up physically and threw her out of bed and she turned the light on and quieted me down. But that was my life for, uh, oh, it took me about 15 years to get over the shock treatment. I've had another bout since, but uh, recovered from it. And then uh, later I met up with a German girl I said, look, I'm headed north. Would you like to come and have lunch with me? I told her that I was heading north to look for a business or something. I was not going back to Tasmania. And uh, I had left my wife. And she said, can I come with you? So that was 57 years together. She was a German girl that I married and she was lovely. But in, uh, she died in 2014 from uh, dementia. Shocking sort of a thing, but it happens. One daughter from the first wife in Hobart. She's been a wonderful, a wonderful daughter all her life. I've got another daughter in uh, Cooper's Plains just down the road from me. She's got six children. I don't ever see them. So, that's life. Enough said. <laughs>